Welcome to Paddy's Say, our regular chat with Swindon trainer Paddy Fitzpatrick. How are you doing, Paddy? Cold. <laughs> <laughs> it is cold in here today. Paddy hasn't put the heating on. Um, hey. uh, we're going to talk about what the game's really like, the behind the scenes kind of tough life that these boxers have to go through. Paddy, what is the reality for a boxer at this level? In fact, a boxer at any level below your Floyd Mayweathers and, and people like that? There's, there's very, very few fighters who make enough money to retire in this game. Very, very small percent. I remember they did a poll years ago, but probably around 10, 20 years ago now, but it was around 3% made enough to retire. Um, you know, there's very, very few Floyd Mayweathers in there. There's very few Ricky Hattons, Oscar De La Hoyas. You know, Ricky Hatton came back and fought Juan Lasgano after two world title losses. 53,000 people came out because they loved him. There's very few of that. There's very few Oscar De La Hoyas who can fight Patrick Charpentier in Texas where no one even knew him. And no one was interested in the fight and he still brings 40, 50,000 people. Very, very few. So to the rest of, of the men out there, they're only going to earn what each individual fight is worth. And there's very few fighters actually understand that. You know, uh, it's tough at the very, very beginning. That's always hard, and that's an obvious one. But it's the requirements and what's what's required you in order to, to grow as a fighter and get your name out there and all that. Most a lot of fighters don't want to go through that. They disappear after 10 or 12 pro fights because they realise just how hard this game is. Um, there's that. Uh, you know, rose-coloured glasses when they turn pro and think, oh, good, I'm a pro, this is this is it. And that's just the beginning. Uh, and then you get the fighters who get to a level where they're in a fight that earns a few million pounds. And they think, OK, this is the level I'm at. But it's not. That fight you were in was the level that you were at. Excuse me. That fight that you were in was, was worth X amount of money. So you made your percent of that money. But that doesn't mean the next fight you're in is going to garner that much interest. And if it doesn't garner that much interest, there's not going to be that much money. So your percent of smaller money. You know, you're in a pay-per-view fight and you're in front of 20,000 people or 30,000 people or more, then you're, you're doing good. But if the next fight you're in doesn't get the public's interest and it's not pay-per-view and you're fighting in front of four or 5,000, that's the money you're going to be getting. And there's so, so many fighters I see 19 years as a, as a coach now. And to be around so many of them and see them making the mistake of arriving in the gym in a flash car and a big chain hanging around their neck because they've just had that big fight. And then the next fight is nowhere near it. And then the car's gone. <laughs> and they're broke. And it's sad because this is a, a game we all get into because we love it so much. But... I don't think they get educated on it before they turn pro. Talking about the education side of things, you were just telling me a second ago that anyone that comes through, you know, your doors as an amateur, wants to be a professional or whatever, you, you try and educate them, in, you know, in the way of the world of boxing and, you know, what a boxer needs to do, what a coach's role is, what a manager's role is, what a promoter's role is. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you say to your boxers. Well, anyone that comes in that gets into my amateur system, they, you know, I don't sit them down and have this big heart-to-heart -heart the second they come through the door. But every one of them are educated on what a promoter is, how he makes his money, what a manager is, what his duties are, how he makes his money, what a coach are and his duties, you know, so that they understand at least the basic framework of what's going on. Duke has been with me eight years. He came to me, he started boxing with me. And six months after he was with me, and, and I knew his intention and I could see the desire and effort he's putting into his work. I educated him then on, on those things, on, on the different roles and how they play out. So I, he had an understanding of it. And um, we were only talking actually last night and he said, you know what, I still had this rose-colored tinted glasses on. Even after all the conversations we've ever had, I still kind of thought, this is going to be okay, this is it's going to be relatively sailing and he said I soon realized no it's not you know he had his eardrum burst and he had another injury and he was out he missed two fights last year 
then it was near the end of the season, so then there's another few months with no, no fights. And you don't earn your money unless you're fighting. And you lose the momentum you've built up because people don't be hearing about you. And uh, luckily with Duke, he is determined to become a world champion. And he, as he's learning, as he's going, he's not somebody that kind of bows down when he realizes times are hard. That just fires him up. But there's a lot of fighters when they realize this is a lot harder than I perceived it to be. But they just think this ain't for me and they bow out. What is the reality for, for a boxer like, you know, Luke or like Sam Smith? You know, a weekly routine for them. Um, because it's it's not as simple as just doing a little bit of training, eating the right foods, mm. and then doing the ring walk and getting in the ring and doing the business. It's, it's a hard, hard career to have, isn't it? It's a hard career to have. Um, Sam works with his dad and his and his um, and his granddad. They have a little firm that does, you know, gardening and, and construction and that. Sam gets up every morning, 5:30 in the morning, five in the morning actually. Drives down. He does 600 miles a week. Drives down to me here in Swindon. He's in the gym 7:30, 8 o'clock. He leaves my gym at 10. Then he drives back up. Luckily, not as far on the way back up because the sites that they're working on are around junction 11 and 12. Does a day's graft, finishes, goes home, has dinner with his wife, then goes to the gym, does his strength conditioning, then comes back, goes to bed, Groundhog Day, does it again. <laughs> and he does that every week, and he's been doing it for a year. And that's, that's his life. But he knows that it's not going to change for quite some time. That's what it is. So you regularly get tested. Is this really what I want? Do I really want this? And if it isn't really what you want, when you get tested, eventually you'll bow out. And you'll be somebody that had those five or ten pro fights and decided you couldn't keep going. You know, I've got to pay bills, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. He understands he's got to pay his bills, so he's in a position where he still works every day to pay those bills. But he's also got a burning desire to be a champion. So he's willing to go through this tougher than, tougher than any other apprenticeship in life to get to that position to be able to earn him, to, to be able to earn that type of money. And that is the reality for the majority of professional boxers, isn't it? Well, look at Random Munro. He was a two-time European champion. He fought for the world title, WBA world title in, in Japan. He fought Scott Quigg twice for his WBA interim title. And he'd done all that while still holding down a job as a bin man. You know, he'd get up at same as Sniper, five in the morning, do the bin work, get finished, then drive an hour or so to uh, his coach's gym, train for a couple of hours, drive back, eat, do his runs and his conditioning, come back, eat, go to bed, and do it all again. And he's an example I use to a lot of the fighters, actually, that don't tell me you can't do it if there's proof of a man who has done it and was successful at it. He was a European champion. He challenged for the world title. He'd done all this while still holding down a job. So when, whenever there's an example out there of anyone that has gone through things in order to be successful, I haven't got time for anyone saying, I can't do it. So what they actually want is it to be handed to them. You know, my destiny, you hear that all the time, is my destiny to be a world champion. Yeah, it's your destiny if you take the right path and do the right things and put in the work required. Then it might become your destiny. But it's not going to be your destiny if you think you're going to sit down at home and someone's going to knock on the door and hand you the belt. That's you're kidding yourself. Um, like I say, people find it out in this game, usually within the first couple of years. And if they don't, and then they go on to earn that good money, a lot of them get found out later on. How many champions is there who's broke now? Sad to see, but broke because they didn't realise that that money wasn't going to come in every fight. Yeah. It's a, a tough, tough sport. I, I think I'm, I'm happy being this side of the camera, <laughs> not having to get up at five o'clock and get up at ten o'clock instead. You've got to love eat, it. eat what I want. But um, we, we all love boxing, but I think, you know, the, the fans out there need to appreciate just how hard it is and, and it isn't as profitable as, as it looks. You know, the glitz and the glamour are the the ring walk and the ring and the shows and we all love those moments but there's so much behind this sport isn't there 
so much behind it. And in the beginning, you know, it's not like you have a job where you're on a wage. In the beginning, unless you've got some, unless you've come from high profile in the amateurs, where sponsors are willing to give you a wage to stay committed in the pros so that you can have a wage and live while you're earning your stripes and, and getting into the title fights. If you don't have that support, if you haven't been a high profile amateur, chances are then you've got to sell your tickets and you've got to sell enough tickets to put on the fight that you're in. So you've got to be able to get yourself out there. You've got to live while you're doing that, so you've got to have some kind of income. And then you've got to sell your tickets in order to in order to do that, please brother. In order to do that. That's it's not a, it's not an easy job, but I think you know if you want to be in this game, if you want to survive in this game, you got to love it. You got to have a passion for it. Don't forget, if the if the fighters are getting peanuts, then the coaches are just getting the shells. <laughs> you know, so yeah, coaches who want to survive in this game too, it's the same thing. You got to be resilient. You got to keep going. You got to believe in what you're doing, and you got to have that that innate desire that you're trying to breed into your fighters. You got to have it too. But it's it's a hard game. But it's you know, it's the best sport in the world. Certainly is, Paddy, and um, you know it's interesting to get your get your views on that. Uh, it's fantastic. We look forward to next week and come up with another interesting topic. I'm sure. Might turn the heat on next week. Hopefully. Uh, might. <laughs> Hopefully, Say Paddy. Might. We have to pay a little bit for that. Yeah, you got to pay a little bit extra. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Paddy, as always. All right, brother. Cheers, buddy. Thank you.